Morning Year 10s. Welcome to my kitchen where there's a kitchen TV and on this TV I will be showing you some of the things that you need to know about William Wordsworth and his extract from the prelude. Um, today we're not going to annotate and analyse the language, form and structure of the poem. Instead we're just going to enter the poem with just some contextual understanding. We're going to be looking at some biographical information about Wordsworth himself. We'll be touching on romanticism and we'll be looking at some of the vocab from the poem. We'll be exploring some of the central themes briefly, and then I'll read the poem to you in readiness for the next lesson, which will be an analysis of the language, form and structure. And attached to this homework is a PowerPoint slide, I'm sorry, four PowerPoint slides with the poem on it. And you can actually print A4 off one side and then print the other other side of the A4 sheet and it would be like that. Then you can stick them together because not everybody has A3 paper printers at home. Um, and on the other side, it should look something like this. Um, However, if you're just writing this down on paper, that too is absolutely fine. But when I talk about the context, I'm expecting detailed notes. When I talk about the themes, I'm expecting you to be able to write them down. These are perfect revision resources for this time next year, and also some of the vocab. And the next lesson will be going through some annotation. So starting with the question, who was William Wordsworth? Um, he's one of my favourite poets in the anthology. He came from not far from where I come from, actually. Um, he was born and grew up in Cockermouth in Cumbria, and um, then Cumberland, in 1770. Here's the house that he was born in. Um, quite a privileged upbringing, you might imagine, looking at the houses on the high street. Inside, it's a museum today. You can go and they've preserved it just as it would have been in Wordsworth's time. So next time you're in the Lake District, do hound your mum and dad and you can go along to Wordsworth's house. Um, sadly, by the time he was your age, both of his parents were dead and buried. Um, and William and his four siblings were dispersed around relatives and William himself was sent off to grammar school, as you might expect from somebody of his class. Now, key to understanding this poem and even romanticism itself is this fact that Wordsworth was lucky enough to grow up in the Lake District and developed a very deep and profound connection with the natural world and with an awe of his beautiful surroundings. Wordsworth wrote poems and guidebooks um, about the majesty and awe of these mountains and these lakes and these towns and the beauty and the profound connection between man and nature. And, the, and you can, when you go to the Lake District, you can really understand what inspired him to have such a profound connection with it. I've lingered on that a little bit longer because it's significant, more significant. He was clever. He graduated from Cambridge in 1791. Um, and while he was there, he met um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. I don't know why I have pictures of just his eyes there, perhaps because the rest of him is doing something with some opium. I don't know. But Samuel Taylor Coleridge, another romantic poet and great in his own right, wrote The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which you might have heard of. Um, but together, the two of them wrote and created this volume of poetry called Lyrical Ballads in 1798. Very key moment, often said to be the kickstarting of romantic movement. Um, in Lyrical Ballads, you have collections of poems by both poets, and they're all of them amazing poems. However, the preface or the beginning of Lyrical Ballads was actually... Um, considered to be a manifesto for the Romanticism. And what you have is William Wordsworth explaining what the Romantic movement was all about. And we will look at some of the language from that later, very briefly. So um, just to move on to the French Revolution, Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge were very interested in what was going on in France at the time where the oppressive monarchy was being overthrown um, and Wordsworth obviously sided with the revolutionaries. He went to experience it firsthand, which wouldn't have been an easy thing to do. Um, and he actually wrote himself that a republic, that is what they ended up with in France, as a a form of government without a royal family. A republic is less oppressive than any other form of government, he wrote. And he was right, possibly. He toured France while he was there. He fell in love with Annette Vallon and had an illegitimate child while he was there. 
kind of left her behind. He's sometimes considered a very early example of a war poet because the Napoleonic Wars were going on. He was writing sonnets about the Battle of Waterloo and anti-war poems about suffering victims and so on. And his poems are so good that he became the Poet Laureate in 1843 when another man from the Lake District died, Robert Southey. Um, so, for all of his... Um, ideals and radical ideas. He died a stuffy Victorian in the year 1850. He lived then in this beautiful cottage in Grasmere, not far from Cockermouth, where he was born, um, and he is buried with his family nearby. Um, now, when he was at Cambridge, he started an enormous volume of poems, called it the Prelude. It was a truly massive poetic undertaking. It was 14 books long. He didn't publish it. His wife published it after he died. Not many people were really interested at the time, but today it is considered his finest work. And the extract from the Prelude that you're looking at comes from book one, when he writes about his spots of time, that is his childhood memories and how they affected the growth of the poet's mind. Um, so, separate section now. What is Romanticism? We need to touch on this again, it's important for this poem, and also we did touch on it with Blake's London and with Ozymandias, but I'm going to go through this very briefly, I've got in small writing there. What is Romanticism briefly? We can't really um, condense it into something other than 12 or 15 hours worth of speech. However, we can just summarise it here, um, although I'm missing some of the text. But romantic doesn't just mean lovey-dovey stuff. It's not just flowers, Valentine's cards and romantic candle-lit dinners. Romanticism is something different. It's, an, it's a key moment in the history of ideas. This is what life looked like before the Romantic Age. It was a time of science, a time of categorising nature, a time of dissecting things, a time of understanding what oxygen is. It was a scientific time known as the Age of Enlightenment. And it, it had lasted perhaps 150 years and it had driven ideas, um, progressively, some might say. Um, and it was unlocking, I mean, this, this actually isn't on the screen here, but science was unlocking nature and its secrets. This is a Joseph Wright of Derby painting where you can see air being pumped out of a, of a jar there so that you can see a bird and how it's suffering. But this gave an understanding of what exactly oxygen was and how it's important. We were trying to unlock nature itself. And this was... Um, this led to people believing that they lived in an enlightened age. That's why we call it the age of enlightenment. And reason replaces sentiment. That's like emotions. Yeah, Reason is like intellect and thinking. And it replaced emotions and the heart. Thinking replaces feeling. Very crudely put. Now, the progress of the enlightenment, which is undeniable, was partnered with a massive industrialization, urbanization, and the, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. So Wordsworth lived through this early Industrial Revolution, the earliest part of it, and he saw that this enlightenment led to urbanization, sometimes squalor and poverty, and some of the, the bad things, the corrupt things about society. And it kind of frustrated him and others too. Um, so when you look at industry, and I've got some more modern pictures here of some of the negative sides of industry, but also they understood then that there was some negativity to it. And when you look at science too, and how it doesn't always mean progress, sometimes it can be abused, sometimes we're trying to understand things that we shouldn't perhaps understand as humans, um, Wordsworth and Romantics wondered whether these concepts, industry and science, could have a positive alternative, whether you could have something different. And so Wordsworth promoted and the Romantics promoted, instead of industry, let's just highlight nature. Nature is a much more organic and sentimental and beautiful thing than industry. So there's no poetry about um, how great industry is or how great urbanisation is. Think about Blake's London. It's cutting about this kind of thing. And instead we celebrate the opposite. And 
when you think of science and trying to unlock and understand nature itself, it's not so key, Wordsworth and Romantics believed, not so key as trying to just accept the world and the cosmos and the universe as it actually is. And that to try and understand it, you're kind of destroying it in a sense. And that it's too, it transcends understanding. It goes beyond understanding. Wordsworth himself wrote in one of his poems, these beautiful words here. He wrote that sweet is the law which nature brings. So this is all sweet stuff. Our meddling intellect, that is this stuff here. Our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous forms of things. It, we murder to dissect, he writes. So by trying to understand the, the cosmos and the universe, we kind of murder it. And we should instead accept that we will not understand it. We should not understand it. And we should just appreciate and accept it. So that's one of the key... Um, the key tenets of romanticism. Um, I've got up here sort of four bullet points, very crudely um, compress romanticism. Romanticism rejects science, mostly, industry, and the progress of the Enlightenment. Romanticism promotes emotion over reason. That is, emotions are more potent and powerful than reasons and thinking. Feelings are more important than thoughts. Hearts, where your emotions reside, are more important than minds and intellect. Romanticism emphasises the power of nature. This poem is all about that. It emphasises the sheer power and awe of nature. Nature, they believe, transcends explanation. In fact, that's what we call the sublime. That is, the un you cannot understand nature. You just have to understand that you cannot understand it. And society also is a corrupting force that erodes the purity of nature. So I've been quite um, brief about romanticism and I've missed some huge chunks, but there's enough there for you to get an idea about how romanticism is important for this particular poem, at least. Um, right, some of the challenging words, which I've also written down on this area here on the back of the poem. Um, elfin, this is mentioned in the poem, it just means small or delicate. Pinnace, I can hear you laughing. Um, it actually, once you're over that laughter, it actually is the name of a small rowing boat, usually carried by bigger ships. Um, a covert is a thicket or a thorny covered area of land. A spectacle, um, is a visually stunning performance. This is nature's performance. Um, grave, solemn or serious, giving cause for alarm. Er, uh, quite literally means over. And poets cheat sometimes to try to fit their meter or the metrical arrangement. They will change two syllables into one by just getting rid of the consonant in the middle and putting the apostrophe there. Um, and bark, which is a very old fashioned word for boat used since before Shakespeare. So some of the themes that you need to write down, these themes, if you don't have this sheet, make sure you're writing it down on a piece of blank paper and calling it at the top themes. Um, just got four principal themes here. The power of nature, the most obvious and clear one. The sheer power of nature over man. In the blue, I've got some of the quotes from the poem. The sheer power of nature over man, that is um, the, the peak, the mountain that he sees in the poem, upreared its head, it towered over him. It led to him understanding nature as having unknown modes of being. The sheer power of nature over man shows itself in the boy's surroundings and ultimately with the lasting and troubling presence in Wordsworth's mind. This might not make so much sense until we've read the poem, but just write it down, then you can look at it again. Loneliness, another big theme. The nighttime setting of this poem. This is um, a poem where we have a boy disappearing into the lake in his boat on his own at the night. The nighttime setting and smallness of the boat enhance the loneliness of the boy Wordsworth. Call it a solitude, he says, of the after effects. Ultimately, in the grand scheme of the cosmos, we are all alone. We all die alone. Um, sorry to be so sad on a Monday morning. Right, memory and emotion, the third of our four 
uh, key themes, memory and emotion. Although this happened in Wordsworth's childhood, this experience that he writes about in this poem, um, it did change him profoundly and forever. Wordsworth wrote that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings that come from emotion recollected in tranquility. So poetry is actually in, sort of very meshed and dovetailed with memory and emotion. And finally, the sublime. Nature simply transcends expression. Language and art cannot express the inexpressible awe of nature. This poem is all about that awe and how it cannot really be comprehended. Consider how Wordsworth, once he has understood that you can't understand nature, expresses it near the end of the poem. Nature he expresses as unknown modes or blank desertion or mighty forms that these are things that are very vague and hard to put words to because that's the whole point it transcends words and language so i'm going to read through the poem now trying to explain it very briefly and then you'll be ready for some annotations that we'll do tomorrow so one summer evening it begins led by her and by this he means mother nature I found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cove, its usual home. Straight I unloosed her chain and stepping in pushed from the shore. So the boy nicks a boat in the middle of the night. Um, it was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure. Nor without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on, leaving behind her still on either side small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. You could imagine this kind of effect being left behind his boat as he rose out away from the rocky cove. Um, but now, oh, hang on, I think I've gone too far. Um, no, I haven't. But now, like one who rose, proud of his skill, to reach a chosen point, with an unswerving line, I fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge. So he can see this ridge line, not this exact one, but you understand. But he's looking up at a ridge. He's tiny beneath it. Um, the horizon's utmost boundary. Far above was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. So he's looking up at this. This is the highest thing that he can see. Um, he then compares his boat to a swan. Um, he says, she was, this is his boat, an elfin pinnace. Lustily I dipped my oars into the silent lake, and as I rose upon the stroke, that is the rowing, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. So this is interesting. A swan is known for its grace and beauty. Heaving might sound a little bit more awkward. Um, when from behind this craggy ridge, this craggy steep, till then the horizon's bound, a huge peak, black and huge, as if with voluntary power instinct upreared its head. So the further away from this ridge he gets, the higher up the peaks behind seem to be. Um, I struck and struck again, and growing still in stature, the grim shape towered up between me and the stars, and still, for it so it seemed, with the purpose of its own, and measured motion like a living thing, strode after me. This now becomes something that is nature personified, and it seems, as he's rowing away in fear, that it's coming after him. He was tiny looking up at this ridge before and now this has appeared from behind it because he's further out into the lake with trembling oars i turned and through the silent water stole my way back to the covert of the willow tree there in her mooring place i left my bark my little boat and through the meadows homeward went in grave and serious mood and then we have a kind of turning point in the poem the after effects psychologically, just like remains, there is an, an after effect psychologically. But after I had seen that spectacle for many days, my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. Over my thoughts there hung a darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. No familiar shapes remained. No pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky, no colours of green fields, but 
huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men moved slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams this is how powerfully nature and that peak personifying it stayed in wordsworth's mind as that young boy and reflecting on it this is quite a troubling and psychological realization that you cannot really understand nature and that kind of ends today's um, lesson. I'm hoping that you will go back, you will watch this again, and you will write down the context, you will write down the themes, and you will write down some of the vocabulary that you might be stuck on, and that you will have ready for the next lesson an actual poem to annotate. Um, thank you very much. Hope you're keeping well, and see you next lesson. Bye.